everyone and welcome to our online service. As you can see, we are worshipping this morning in Green Gears Parish Church. Our church is a linked church. And one thing is for certain, a warm welcome always awaits you here at Green Gears. As you can see, we have a beautiful cross behind me, gifted by a local businessman, John Walker. The beautiful stained glass is from Iona. And I am sure that you would all agree that the beauty of this cross helps to uplift our spirits for all who worship here. We also have beautiful banners around our church, which were made by Ruby Thompson, who was a church officer here for many years. And she was assisted by Margaret Muir. The presence of the cross and the banners certainly enhance this peaceful sanctuary and provide those who worship here with food for thought. Later on in our service, I'm delighted to say that Sheena, the session clerk at this church, will lead our prayers of intercession. And I'm delighted to announce, as I'm sure you've heard on the Scottish news, that our churches will be open next week for Palm Sunday. And it will be great to share fellowship with people within the church buildings. I'm sure that you will find it hard to believe that it's now a year since we started recording our online services. Initially with Bill Jackson, who retired, and more recently with myself. And I would like to thank everyone who has supported and encouraged us during this time. All who have joined our online services, our two church families, and others from different churches. I would also like to thank all who have participated in the service. And last but not least, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Billy Cargill for his dedication, inspiration and professionalism. I'm sure that you would all agree that his gift of faith, commitment, artistic talent and depth of spirituality shine through these presentations. Billy has put a lot of time and effort and it's been encouraging for me that so many have felt blessed by his contribution and this special ministry that he has. Thanks for everything, Billy, for your special ministry to our online services and for all the other service you give within the church. Last week it was great to have two wing men, one on the left and one on the right, Billy and his son Mitchell. And it's great to see that Billy's passing on his talents to his son and trying to keep me in order, underline the word try. One of our members, Lorraine, suggested that it would be nice to have an Easter bonnet competition and details of this competition can be found on the church Facebook page. And as I've said before, can I encourage you to have a look at our Facebook page where you can see our weekly Wednesday message, information about our church, our children's page, and I would like to thank again Tom and all who contribute to this important media page. And whilst the doors of our churches have been closed, we have had this platform to advertise and celebrate what we do. This morning, as always, our first candle reminds us of the need for light and for hope as we continue to live through this COVID pandemic. And on the 23rd of March, we have been encouraged to light a candle at home at seven o'clock. And this 
is called Light for Lives and different churches within Scotland are taking part to remember all those who have died during the past year due to the COVID pandemic and also to pray for those who have experienced loss. Our second candle is lit to remind us that God so loved the world and that he continues to love this world and everyone in it. It reminds us of Jesus, the light of the world, of his ministry, and also reminds us of the ministry of the whole people of God. Let us pray. God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of all grace, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains life, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, for the love of family and friends. We thank you for this new day, for our lives, for your grace, for your promise to be with us, to be our God and to give us salvation. For these and all your blessings, we give you thanks in Jesus' name, who taught us when to pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, hear us now as we bring before you our prayers of intercession. We pray for the whole church, all the people of God, all who respond to the call of Jesus, follow me. 
We pray for our congregations here, for our church families, for our office bearers and all involved in our youth organisations. Help us as a church to be a beacon of light, to demonstrate your love in all we say and do, so that others may see you at work in our lives. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of the earth, for all who govern and judge, for all who guide us through this pandemic. We pray for our Queen and her family during these difficult days, thanking you for her dedicated service and commitment to our nation and the Commonwealth. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their head. May we as individuals, as a church and as a nation, do all we can to meet their needs. May they hear of joy and gladness, that those who are broken may rejoice. We pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely. Give them the joy of your saving help and sustain them with your bountiful spirit. We pray for those who have been bereaved. Give them comfort and peace. And we bring before you in the silence of our own hearts, our own prayers for those known to us. Lord, may each one prayed for experience that peace and hope that you alone can give. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. As we prepare our hearts to remember your death and resurrection, grant us the strength and wisdom to serve and follow you this day and always. Amen. May the word of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God and our Redeemer. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent, and in some Christian traditions, it's known as Passion Sunday. As such, it marks the start of Passion Tide, the final two weeks of Lent, ending on Holy Saturday in some parts of Scotland and Northern England. Passion Sunday is also known as Carling Sunday, traditionally a dish of parched peas cooked in butter called a carling was eaten on this day. A meal associated with the time when Jesus' disciples plucked and ate the heads of wheat on the Sabbath. This Sunday is also sometimes referred to as Care Sunday but care in the sense of suffering. This is the time when the suffering of the Lord Jesus becomes the focus of the church's attention. A week before Palm Sunday, we begin to meditate on the intense sorrow Jesus endured on his road to the cross. And shortly afterwards, to resurrection and victory. Today is another stepping stone on the journey towards Easter. So let's consider our Old Testament reading, taken from the book of Jeremiah at chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The words, the days are surely coming, are packed with promise and brimming with hope. 
Nowhere else in the Hebrew Bible is the expectation of a new era more explicit. Jeremiah's prophecies reach a climax here. The central theme, the assured new covenant, has through the Latin language brought us the name of the final portion of the Bible, the New Testament. These verses are like a portal between two parts of our Christian scriptures. Centuries later, the writers of Hebrew quote Jeremiah at length as a means of making sense of what has occurred. In fact, this passage from Jeremiah provides the most substantial portion of Hebrew scripture quoted in the New Testament. The high water mark of messianic prophecy looks beyond the immediate context of the Assyrian regime, teetering on the brink of collapse, and the superpowers of Babylon struggling for world domination. Jeremiah is used by God to provide one of the clearest glimpses of the radically different age that will be initiated in the incarnation, life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wonder what the hearers of Jeremiah's prophecies imagined at that time. Could they have imagined how God would fulfil his promises? Wondering how those of the prophet's own era and Jeremiah understood this prophecy should encourage humility in us as we too wonder how God's promises will still work out. It should also foster deep hope and trust. Here is an unconcealed reminder that God's plans are revealed and God gives us good reason to hope and pray. Having evoked hope of a new era, Jeremiah emphasises that this will not be just another renewal of the old covenant. What is envisaged here is deeper, dealing with the underlying issue, tackling humankind's rebellious nature. The problem of the heart is at the heart of so much suffering, and that is where God intervenes. The New Age Jeremiah foresees what will be fundamentally different. The outcome of an inside-out transformation. The intentions of God's law. The desire for a society rooted in love will be written on hearts. Some people have words or symbols they associate with people or causes they care about, tattooed on their skin. This shows passion and commitment. And how much greater is this shown by God? Who has not only inscribed you on the palm of his hands, but also written on our hearts, ensuring that God's character and priorities become part of us? The final verse of this passage is striking because of its intimacy a new society is born, where a deep regeneration leads to people drawn together in a loving family, where social status is irrelevant, and all know the Almighty Lord as Abba, Father. This passage then teaches us about the promise of the new covenant and reinforces that God has a plan for us. And reassuringly, this passage reminds and affirms the promise of God's love. I find the following words very reassuring in a changing world. I will be their God and they will be my people. We need hope at this time. We need reassurance. And as we read through scripture, we see God's plan at work. We read of prophecies, we find comfort in his promises at this time of year. And we remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, our Lord, 
so that we would have life in all its fullness and the promise of eternal life. On this Passion Sunday, we turn to our Gospel reading from John chapter 12, verse 20, where the story of the Passion is told. In this passage, Jesus predicts his death. And within John's Gospel, there is an ultimate countdown. It's not related to an annual occurrence, but to a once in eternity, never to be repeated event. John's writing some years afterwards has already let us into the mystery. The Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. However, it's worth remembering that to those present at that time, the identity of this remarkable man came gradually, revealed sign by sign, claim by claim. John, more than other gospel writers, explains how the miracles of Jesus were more than actions in history. They provided windows into the character of God. Having just miraculously fed thousands, Jesus revealed himself as the bread of life. While healing a blind man, he claimed to be the light of the world. His encounter with the Samaritan woman revealed God's omniscience and perfect knowledge and highlighted Jesus' intimate relationship with his Father. And throughout the Gospel, John regularly takes us back to a ticking clock. Jesus was always aware of the eternal plan in which he stood centre stage. To his mother at the wedding in Cana, Jesus said, My time has not yet come. And seven times we are told, a time is coming. His persecutors couldn't touch him because his time had not yet come. As we know, as the time approaches for Jesus to die and rise and consummate the hope for all generations, he prays, Father, the time has come. Today's passage makes sense when understood in the context of divine countdown. As we read, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip and asked to meet Jesus. It was quite obvious that things had been building up to a crisis point, And that crisis had now come to the Jews. To the Jews, the Son of Man stood for the undefeatable world conqueror sent by God. When Jesus mentions that the Son of Man would be glorified, he meant crucified. The conquest for Jesus was the cross, and the Jews did not understand this. As we reflect on Jesus' journey to the cross, the way in which he cared for and listened to others, the way in which he gave time to those marginalised by society, the way in which he healed the sick, when we reflect on his teaching about the kingdom of God, Let's remember our own call to discipleship and the sacrifice given. When we think of the disciples and what they must have been thinking at this time, it must have been challenging for them. You can understand their fear, their fear of authority, of the future, what would happen next. This is also a time to reflect on the suffering of Jesus on the way to the cross. He was despised and rejected by many. He was betrayed by some of his followers and abandoned in his time of need. He experienced the pain of rejection, loneliness and physical pain on his way to the cross. On this Passion Sunday, as we remember the suffering Christ, the sacrifice made for us, for you and for me, what is our response? In what way does it touch our lives? Do we need to make changes? Do we have our priorities right? 
Where does our commitment to Jesus fit in with our plans and God's plans? As pilgrims on the journey through Lent and as we approach Easter, we need to remember that we have this promise of hope. A hope that so many people don't have. And I'm sure that you would agree that the lectionary readings from Jeremiah and John carry a scent of hope-filled anticipation of yet a new era to come, an age of greater intimacy between creation and our Creator, and remind us of the climax of Jesus' life, death and of course the resurrection. Many years ago I had the privilege of visiting Oberammergau to see the Passion Play. It was a spiritual experience and I often recall to mind some of the scenes as I journey through Lent and Holy Week. The story of Christ's passion and death presented in this way provided me with plenty of food for thought. And I remember most of all my disappointment when it ended because I felt that the story of the resurrection would have featured more. The story of Christ's passion, the journey to the cross, leads us today to the promise of the resurrection and new life. Let's remember, as we continue to make this journey, to reflect on our own commitment as servants. Could we do more? Are we using our God-given gifts? Are there avenues where you could offer to serve? Or are we going to leave it to someone else? Amen. And to God be the glory. Great things he has done. Let us pray. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. May we be rooted and grounded in love. 
May we grasp the full breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. We, may we know that love which surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God and may his power continue to work within us. May his will be done. Amen. In our Lenten journey, may our hope be longer than the journey, our faith deeper than darkness, our love bold, and God's story of salvation more than a cross. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, this day and forevermore. Amen.